right, All right. Thank you, Maha. You can begin. Yeah. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me um, to learn more about how to read chest x-rays. And this is our very first lecture in the radiology club. Can you guys hear me good? Yes, okay, I'll take that. Yes, All right, sure. You. All right. Um, so today we will be discussing in systematic approach how to read chest x-rays from the very beginning to the very end. Um, we will go through some of the basics. Um, so you can't give uh, or you can't order chest x-rays for absolutely everyone because if you may or may not know, chest x-rays have radiation and uh, radiation is just um, not something you want to expose your bodies to. We'll talk more about radiation soon, um, but before we do that, we will discuss um, some of the basics. So when do you um, opt for x-rays? When do you um, decide that, you know what, this patient is going for x-ray? Um, we'll talk more about how do x-rays work, how to read x-rays, obviously, and then we'll end the presentation with a case. So let's start from the get-go. If those, those are some of the things that um, you need to go over if you're unsure um, whether or not your patient would need um, a chest x-ray. So you need to focus on some symptoms. So if your patient presents with shortness of breath, chest pain, cough, um, sorry, something happened. Give me a second. Okay. Um, so, so those are some of the symptoms. Cough, hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is um, uh, coughing up blood, um, any um, unusual physical signs such as hypoxemia, abnormal pulmonary examination, or if you if you do a, a physical examination on your patient, you've noticed that their pulmonary exam is a bit off, um, crackles, wheeze, any of those signs, then you need to investigate. And that's when you, um, you know, um, ask the patient to have a chest x-ray done. Also, uh, sometimes when you have to place lines or tubes, such as central lines, NG tubes, and et cetera, you would need to confirm your placement after, so you would obviously um, do another chest x-ray. If you suspect that your pacemaker, pacemaker has a fracture, then you obviously need a chest x-ray. And finally, if you need to screen for a pneumothorax. Now, um, this is a criteria, if you guys need to go into detail, this is a criteria that, that you can find online. It's called the appropriateness criteria. It's, a, it's the American College um, of, Ra of Radiology. Um, they basically, they have a list of topics. So if you guys look here, so there are so many topics, acute respiratory illnesses, acute respiratory illnesses, immunocompromised, immunocompetent, um, hemoptysis, et cetera. So if you click on narrative and rated and rating table, you should get something like this. And um, so you would basically have different variants and different um, topics basically. And once you click on any of these topics, you should get something that looks like this. And um, you need to go over something. So this is chest, um, x-ray, CT, uh, uh, radiography of the chest. And I don't know if you guys can notice, but radiography of chest, which is X, chest x-ray, has one point radiation. Compare that to a CT, this has three points. So this brings me to um, how do chest x-rays work, and we should talk more about radiation. Um, so just basics um, about chest x-rays. This is your patient. Uh, and this is, this is your digital machine or digital detector. And then this is your actual um, X-ray machine. So our patient here is doing something called a PA viewed X-ray, which means a posterior anterior view. So the chest X-ray would be situated um, behind the patient while the patient faces front, faces the digital detector. And then the photons would basically get emitted through the patient, whatever is black, on the x-ray gets absorbed by the digital detector, whatever, anything that uh, stays white, such as solids and liquids, they would basically get absorbed by the patient. Now, if you find black on a chest x-ray, that would indicate air. Anything that's solid, kind of liquid, that's white. Now, this is a very important question. So many, so many people are worried, worried about um, whether uh, chest rays are chest x-rays are dangerous or not. Um, we talked about this briefly. Chest x-rays, usually a two-view chest x-ray would have an average of 0.001 millisieverts. Um, compare that to a CT scan that has four to seven millisieverts. And according to the American College of Radiation, you need to limit your 
chest x-rays as a person. So I can't have more than 10,000 chest x-rays in my lifetime. And that is also equivalent to 25 CT scans. Now, this is the fun part. This is where we um, learn how to go over the chest x-ray bit by bit. And we, there are so many different ways, so many different mnemonics, but this is something that I find and so many people find easy um, to look at. So we always start with patient ID and quality. Who's this patient? Is she female? Is he male? How old is this patient? Um, and then you look for the image quality, which we will talk about soon. And then you move on to A, B, C, D, E. A stands for airway, B stands for bones and breathing, C is for circulation, D for diaphragm and delicates, and then extras. And we will talk about all these things in detail. So this is basically the principle of the systematic approach. Okay, so as always, we always start with normal. You need to know how normal looks like before you compare normal to abnormal. So here's Jane, obviously female, and um, she's a 40 year old um, who basically had a chest x-ray and this is how a normal chest x-ray should look like. This is a PA uh, view and we'll talk about this um, a little bit in detail um, in, in, the, in the few slides, in a few more slides. And this is um, a lateral view and we'll talk about why you need um, lateral, lateral views and why you need, why do you um, go for uh, PA or AP views. So we'll start with patient ID and image quality. We already know who our patient is. She's a 40 year old uh, female. Her name is Jane. And um, we'll start off with quality. So in quality, uh, there, are so, so, there are some things that you need to focus on. You need to um, go over to know whether or not your chest x-ray or the chest x-ray that you've ordered has good quality. Aside from the obvious um, facts or the obvious um, things that you can look at. This looks a little bit poor quality compared to this one. This is from the bigger picture, but if you need to go into detail, you need to go through the projection, the penetration, inspiration, and rotation. Those four things are very important when you when it comes to assessing quality. So um, projection is deciding whether this is AP or PA. PA is posterior anterior, so it's exactly what I showed you with the patient. The patient would be standing, the chest x-rays behind me, and then the digital detectors in front of me. If I wanted to do an AP chest x-ray, this is usually, and we do this in patients who are laying down supine, who are basically in ICU or the emergency ward, um, but usually we, we like to um, use the PA um, projection, and we'll talk about this more, um, but this patient has PA. We'll talk about how I know how I knew this was PA. And then we would talk about penetration. So is this, does this x-ray have adequate penetration or inadequate penetration? And for you to see that, you need to see at least eight vertebral bodies. So if you guys can zoom in and count the vertebral bodies with me, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And you can see some borders here. So this has good penetration. Now for inspiration, we also need to decide whether this is adequate or not. You need to count eight anterior ribs. So um, if you guys can look closer again, the ribs will go this way. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if you can't do that, then just go for um, the ribs on the back. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is for inspiration. Rotation um, is a, a little bit tricky. You need to know if this patient is rotated. And the reason why you need to know the patient is rotated to this way or to that way is because we need to assess the trachea, which we will come to talk about soon. Your trachea should be central. So my, my air, my, my windpipe or my trachea should be in the middle. If I am rotated, that could falsely sh uh, uh, um, indicate that my trachea would be deviated when it's not deviated. So how do you know if your patient is rotated or not? You need to check um, the distance between the head of the clavicles and um, and the, 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 the spine. So you need equal. So, so if your spine runs in the middle and then you see both of your clavicles and that so that's not rotated and your clavicles would be in a, in a particular level, same level. If you were to compare this nice looking um, HD quality x-ray and compare it to this poorly 
um, um, poor x-ray or, or, or x-ray with poor quality. I can barely see the vertebrae. I can't count eight ribs. There's one, two, three, four, five, maybe six, and I can't see the rest. So you get the idea of quality. Now, for projection, um, this is when we talked about what's PA versus AP. And um, there are some things that you uh, need to also focus on to decide whether this projection is AP or PA. So basics, AP is anterior posterior, while PA is posterior anterior. And um, the first thing that you need to look at are the clavicles. So if you notice the PA, the clavicles are a bit on the, the, the lungs. So they're a little bit underneath the apices of the lungs. So they run um, uh, over the lungs. Uh, while in PA, AP, sorry, you can barely see them over the lung fields. Um, the scapula in the PA is away from the um, air fields or the lung fields. Um, and this is why PA is preferred over the AP because sometimes the scapula, if you guys can, can look here, there's a line over here, and that's most probably the scapula, and that will get you confused. Um, you think that, what is this? Is this something with the lung? Is this a scapula? What's going on? So that's why we always prefer PA when it comes to lung fields. Um, also in PA, the lungs are a bit oblique, so they go down, downwards to the side, while in AP, they're straight um, and they're more horizontal. Um, the spinous processes in... Um, uh, in, in the PA, obviously, because I'm taking the, the image standing here and then the x-rays coming behind me. So you, you will be able to see my spinous processes, um, which are the ends of, of my vertebral bodies. Uh, finally, um, when it comes to uh, uh, PA versus AP, uh, let's pretend that this is the same patient, um, but I've taken a PA and then I took an AP image. If you guys can notice the heart here, um, the size of the heart looks regular to me. In the AP, in the AP setting, the heart looks enlarged, and it, it's not really enlarged. It's just that it's the fact that you took the image from the front, and if you look at the heart from the front, it usually looks larger than looking at the heart from the back. So this heart could be the same size as this heart, but it just depends on um, where you or how you took the image. Now, for lateral views, we usually use um, this type of... Yes. Yeah. Some Someone unmuted. Do you guys want to say something? Okay. So, in the lateral view, um, we usually take this, um, this view because we want to look at... So, let's say we suspect something going on with the lungs and you're unsure of whether this is the right lobe or the right middle lobe or the whatever kind of lobe that you need to look at. So we do a lateral view along with the fact that um, some organs would overlap other organs. So we need to take a lateral view to look at things from a different perspective. Okay, now this is where the interactive part comes in. Uh, we'll, start working, we'll start working our way from airway to extras. And if you guys need to unmute your mics, um, share your thoughts and ideas about um, the, the following questions, please do so. So let's start with airway. Um, just some general, general things or general topics about the airway. The airway is basically your trachea. Your trachea has to be in the middle. It has to be central. It, ha it can't be deviated to the right or to the left. And then you have the right main bronchus and then the left main bronchus. So two, two main bronchi. Um, I, if you guys can notice, the right main bronchus is a bit um, a horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical, so it's a bit steeped compared to the left main bronchus, and that's important because if someone aspirates a foreign body, they're more this foreign body is most likely going to get lodged over here compared to the other lung. It's 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 rare for you to find an um, a foreign body lodged in the left main bronchus, but it could happen. So keep that in mind. Okay, so. As always, we compare normal to abnormal. So here is Jane, and we are doing airway. So this is Jane, and this is our patient. Um, if you guys want to unmute your mics and um, tell me if you can notice anything unusual in this x-ray. OK. It's pretty simple, very easy. If you guys need to unmute your mics, that would be great.
Okay, um, so I'll just go ahead and say that. Did anyone unmute their mics? Okay, so I'll go ahead and say that this trachea was deviated to the right. How did I know that? If you guys look here, the spinous processes and, um, and the trachea are aligned. So there's a border here and then the other border here for the trachea. And then in the middle, you have the spinous processes. But if you compare this to that, your spinous processes kind of go to the middle and then your trachea deviates to the right. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So this is tracheal deviation. Now moving on to breathing and bones, we'll start with bones. Um, so when I talk about bones, when it comes to chest x-rays, I talk about every single bone that surrounds my thorax or my thoracic cavity. So I have the clavicles, which are my collarbones, and then my vertebral bodies at the back, my ribs, my sternum, my manubrium. So I need to look at those bones, make sure everything's in place, nothing is fractured, etc. Now this is going to be a little, this is going to be easy. It's pretty obvious. So this is Jane, and this is our patient. What do you guys think is going on in our patient or with our patient? A uh, fracture of multiple ribs. Perfect. Where, where, where is that? Is this on the right side or the left side? The right side. Perfect. So let's point them out. So th those are multiple um, uh, rib fractures, and um, multiple rib fractures are usually um, they're coiled in, in a term called um, a, a flail chest. This is an emergency um, because those bones can actually um, penetrate um, your lung, your your lobes, and that's pretty dangerous. You need to you need your patient's uh, lungs to be intact. So multiple. We're looking at whether or not um, there are, um, you know, opacities or nodules. Uh, where are they situated, really? Are they around the, the, the heart? Are they um, scattered? Is it bilateral? Is it one? Is it multiple? And then we have to obviously look at the lobes, make sure that all the borders are, uh, are visible. Um, for example, if, you, if this lobe is not visible then this, and, and it's white, then maybe you have something going on over there. Um, look for something called atelectasis, which is a lung collapse. Also, you need to identify where is this happening? Is this on the right? Is this on the left? You also need to talk about hyperinflation. Usually in hyperinflation, this is usually caused or seen in asthma or asthmatic patients. The diaphragms are pushed to the bottom. We'll talk more about this when it comes to diaphragm. And obviously here, I just need you guys to remember that the right lung has three lobes, three different lobes, while the left lung has two lobes. And that's because your heart sits here and there's not much, much space for a third one. Now, now um, as always, normal versus abnormal. Here's your normal. And we'll start with A. What do you guys think is going on with A? If you guys don't know what's going on, at least describe what you see. If you guys want to um, um, write it down in the in the conversation box, I can read that off my phone. I'll give you guys two minutes tops. Okay. Um, so I'll explain what's going on here. Sara said patient B has consolidation. Perfect, Sara. Okay, Varshini says the left lung in A. Absolutely. What do you think is going on with the left lung? It's very dark, so I think there's a lot of um, space. Okay. What do you think is in that space? Um, more air. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you look at this lung, the right lung, you can see all those... Um, Absolutely, Sara, this is pneumothorax of the left lung. But if you look at the right lung, you can see all the, those are vessels. They're nice, uh, they're, they're, they're nice shadows. You can see everything, like there's, there's a little bit of opacity or whiteness, and then there's darkness. But over here, you literally have, it's just black. You can't see the vessels, you can't see the lymph nodes, you can't see anything. So this is air. I know this is very confusing, but we have air in our lungs, and then sometimes 
that air could exit our lungs and, and go in between the space, so in between the parietal peritoneum, uh, the parietal um, uh, peritoneum, the parietal uh, um, viscera, I mean the visceral uh, or pleura, parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. So visceral is whatever is on your lungs, and then at, at the outer at the outer part, that's your parietal. So if you have air in that space, then you should see something like that. It, it should look black, and you can't, you should not see. Um, um, you know, all those vessels. Um, also, I need you guys to um, remember that I know we're working on the lungs and breathing, but if you guys can look closer, um, we have a, a little bit of uh, um, tracheal deviation to the right, and that's logically because you have more air here, and that would push your content uh, to the left side, or to, to the right side, to the opposite side. Um, B, absolutely, Sarah, this is, a con this is consolidation. Uh, where do you think we could find consolidation? In pneumonia? Absolutely, in pneumonia, good. So what do you think, where, where is the pneumonia? Is this, is this generalized pneumonia? Is this low bar pneumonia? What kind of pneumonia is this? Low bar, perfect. So what lobe? Right lobe pneumonia. What 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 lobe? What right lobe is consolidated? Lower lobe. Try again. Mm -mm. Try again. Try again. I know. Right, lower lobe is exactly its middle, and the reason why it's not lower because. If it was a, the lower lobe that was if that that'll be affected, you should get white. This should look white consolidated. There's there's a a nice lower lobe that's still fine, but this is kind of like the middle lobe, and you have like a wedge shape to the middle lobe. So yeah, absolutely, this is most likely uh, pneumonia. Also, Vashini uh, commented on that. Yes, the aortic arch is a bit. Um, widened or dilated, but we will talk about this more in circulation, which is after breathing. Um, finally, C. I don't know if anyone commented on C. Granuloma of the upper lobe of the left lung. So this is an abscess, absolutely. So this is an abscess, and um, and, and the reason why um, so many people get, con get this confused with uh, tumors, they, they kind of look the same, but in abscesses, you literally have a border, a halo. So there's a border, and then that's white, and then in the middle, it's a bit dark. So this is pneumothorax, there's pneumonia, and that's an abscess. Now, moving on to circulation. Um, so when it comes to... Yeah, so uh, Dr. Rania is saying silhouette sign. Um, so middle lobe obscures the right heart border, okay? Um, now let's talk about circulation. In circulation, we focus on the heart and um, the vessels that are, that are around the heart. So the heart size, the heart borders, or the heart border, the aorta, the mediastinum in general. And um, so we'll, we'll, we'll just, just some basics. Your heart size should be equivalent to 55% of your whole thorax. So if it's a little bit more than 55%, so if it's more than half, then that's something called cardiomegaly. Um, and that usually happens from heart failure um, and other causes. Um, something else that you need to also um, focus on are your heart borders. So you need to have clear heart borders, um, nothing hazy or, or, you know, no extra shadows. You need, you need that clear heart border along with your aortic um, arc. And then you, if you if you want, you can look at your pulmonary trunk, um, and et cetera. Also, something else that you need to also mind or, or look at would be your hyla or one hilum or your, your hilar spaces. Um, we usually have lymph nodes um, in these areas. So you need to make sure that nothing is enlarged and stuff like that. And then look at whether or not this is hypervascular. Is it displaced? Is it, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe um, look at calcification of the aorta as well. Okay, normal versus abnormal. Jane versus A.
So we'll, we'll start from the top. We'll do heart size and then we'll move down to heart borders, aortic arch, any calcification, uh, cancel calcifications, and then look at the hilum. The heart is enlarged in A. Absolutely. So this is so this heart looks more than 55% of the whole uh, mediastinum or thorax. Um, so this is more likely or most likely going to be cardiomegaly. Um, what about in B? This one's a bit not so clear, but look at the size, move down to heart borders, and then move to the hyla. The bronchi on the right side. So, yeah. So, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think is going on here? Yeah. So those are enlarged, or those are enlarged lymph nodes or lymph adenopathies. This is usually um, this happens from infections or cancers. Um, or tumors um, that have spread to other areas, but usually infection, um, uh, etc. So it's it's right there. Look how it's dense and it's it's white. There's a little bit of opacity over here, but okay. Moving down to diaphragm and delicates. Um, general um, information about uh, or general facts about the diaphragm. Your right diaphragm is obviously higher than or more superior than your lower diaphragm and that's because you have the liver your liver sits over here while your stomach is a bit um, uh, at the bottom your liver is a very solid organ so it usually pushes the diaphragm um, upwards um, also i need you guys to learn something called the costophrenic angle so it's an angle that has it's, it's it has to be black if this is obscured or this looks white then there's something going on so look at the the borders or uh, the borders of uh, both hemi diaphragms, one diaphragm right, one diaphragm right hemi diaphragm, left hemi diaphragm, and then look at the angles. Make sure that the angles are clear. Make sure that they're a little bit elevated. Um, if they were both pushed down, and that would be hyperinflation. So your chest is logically filled with um, air, and and your your basically your lungs get pushed down or your your um, diaphragms. Oh, so sorry. Something else about delicates. Delicates is um, your your soft tissue around um, your thorax. So skin, fat, anything around that. Okay. So normal versus abnormal. We'll start with A. Take your time. Pneumoperitoneum, absolutely, Sara. Good job. So, um, if you look here, that's the diaphragm. That little line, that that little line, that's that's the diaphragm. Underneath that, you have to see the liver. It has to be intact. So, liver, diaphragm. If it's something like that, then there's something going on in the middle. So that could be uh, fluid, um, it could be uh, blood, anything like that, and it happens from uh, various reasons. Um, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, moving on to B. This one's pretty straightforward. If you guys don't know what's going on, then just comment on um, um, what's going on. So where's the where's the issue? We're talking about the diaphragm. Is this the right diaphragm, the right hemidiaphragm, left hemidiaphragm? Mm -hmm. uh, is this a delicate blunting of the claustrophrenic angle, pleural effusion? Good, Mariam. Amazing. So there's pleural effusion over here, and the reason the pleural effusion is literally water. Um, that and so instead of air, remember when we did pneumothorax? So that was air. It was black. But the reason why this is white is because it's fluid, and obviously fluid due to gravity would settle down compared to air. That'll be um, it'll be all over. It. So if you guys notice here, spoiler alert: this is pneumothorax. So compare air, free air. To free fluid, uh, it's a little bit different. So there's free air all over the whole thing, but um, fluid usually settles down, um, and that's due to gravity. 
So absolutely. There's blunting of the costophrenic angle. Also, there's another sign that's called the convex. So if this is concave, um, you would know that this is more likely uh, to be pleural effusion. You need that nice border, that costophrenic angle. And if it's not there and it's white, then usually you'd have fluid settling over there. What about C? Now, this one's a bit tricky, but um, pleural rupture. This one's a bit tricky. So this patient had a pleural tube, a drain. Um, and now we're talking about the delicates. Forget about diaphragm for a second. Now we're talking about delicates. If you guys notice here, literally between the rib cage, or the, the, between the pleura and the skin, there's black. That's air. So this is called subcutaneous uh, emphysema. Exactly, subcutaneous emphysema. So it's it, it's usually free air that goes um, between your skin and your um, thorax. Finally, this is extras. I'll let you guys um, enjoy extras. So we'll start with this image. What do you guys think um, is going on here? A pacemaker, absolutely. So this machine, exactly. Pacemakers usually go on the left side of the chest. So this is a pacemaker. Um, it regulates the heart rhythm and it's usually on the left side. So if I look at that, I know that my patient would have a pacemaker. What about this here? There's a foreign body. Absolutely. So there's a foreign body. Um, what bronchus do you think was affected? What bronchus was blocked? So the hint, the hint to answer that question is, look at the lungs. Um, is, is the right lung fine? Is the left lung fine? Is it the left lung? Yeah, it's, it's more like, yeah, it's most likely to be the left lung because this is white. This lung is white. There's no air coming towards that lung. And um, yes, left main bronchus. Exactly. I, I, I tricked you guys because I said that, yes, your right bronchus goes a little bit down. So foreign bodies are more likely to get lodged um, in this bronchus. But this happens. Those left uh, bronchial blocks happen from foreign bodies. What about here? This this one's weird. Is it a misplaced NG tube? Absolutely. This is a misplaced NG tube. So an NG tube is your nasal gastric tube. So your your nasal gastric tube should go down and then into your your stomach. So if that is off, then there, there's something wrong. And lastly, very simple, very easy. Electrodes, ECG electrodes, absolutely. Nice. Okay. Can I stop here for a second? I just want yeah. to show something. Yes. This that was excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Mahad. I just want to show that uh, on the first one, I want someone to tell me what this black thing is. Oh, do, uh, I don't know how to control this. Don't do I have control? Uh, yes, I gave you control. Um, I'm trying to draw over it. Okay, so can you point under the diaphragm of the first patient from yes. yours because mine is not able. Mm -hmm. So, so what would that be? And also on the left under the left hemidiaphragm as well. It's, it's, it's more difficult to see, but it's there. Mm -hmm. So what would that be? Let's say um, uh, this patient perfect. had a had a um, gynae laparoscopic procedure the day before. Mm -hmm. what, what, what would that be? What's perforation? What? Perforation uh, and that's medium, free it's air. It's a small amount of air in the in the abdomen. So the first question I would ask before suspecting perforation, did this patient have an operation like lapro in laparoscopy? They would uh, uh, intentionally put some air right into the peritoneum so that they can work easily. So a small amount of air 
uh, before freaking out, I would first ask if the patient had, uh, especially if it's an inpatient, I'll first ask mm. if there, there was a procedure. Small amount like this is regularly seen after laparoscopic uh, uh, procedures. Then on the mm -hmm. second patient uh, in the screw uh, forium body, uh, can you please just point out the heart for us? So, so the, the clue here, yes, it's on the left, and we have the right and left markers. Uh, so we see that whiteness on the left hemithorax because of the heart. So basically the heart is most of that whiteness that we can see. So the heart is basically probably some something like that. I don't know how to control this. Uh, can you see my, uh, my arrow? No. Right, okay. So basically most of the whiteness that you can see filling the, the left side space is the heart. Why? Because mm -hmm. there's volume loss. Because of this volume body, the air is not going mm -hmm. into the left lung. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the left lung is mostly collapsed and the, the heart is shifted all the way to the left. And most of the and the right uh, uh, lung is seen uh, bigger because it's just hyperinflated and the left lung is collapsed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if this was a child and he uh, uh, he uh, swallowed a Lego piece that that is plastic and we can't see it, we're not going to see this, but we're going to see this. So, right. so that's, it's it's a very good picture, this one, to just take a photograph of and keep in, in the back of your mind, because if it's a child that, that choked on uh, on a forium body that is not radiopaque, then that's what we're going to see. So the whiteness on the left side is is mostly the heart. First, identify the heart, and I like how you you started with the ABCDs. So if you do, if you if you identify the heart, then then that will be the clue. Um, yeah, and excellent cases. Thank you, Maha. I'll mute. Thank them. you. So much. Just Thank one you. question. So um, if there's after a surgery or laparoscopic procedure, if there's air still inside the uh, peritoneum, should we be worried about it or? No, a small, small amount, I wouldn't be worried about it. But let's say this patient, it depends what kind of procedure. If it was laparoscopic procedure, that means we went into the peritoneum and we, uh, we've put uh, uh, carbon rights uh, inside and we, because we wanted to inflate the peritoneum to be able to work. But let's say this patient did not have laparoscopy and had, uh, for example, colonoscopy. Then we will be worried about perforation. Mm. Okay. It depends where did they go. So, so it's really difficult for us, for the geologist, uh, to uh, to guess what the surgeon did. That's why we always we always do better job when we discuss with our colleagues. So, if I d if I call my doctor and ask him, what did you do? What where exactly did you go? It's not like he just had an operation the day before. I need to know where exactly did he go to know what is the risk of uh, of it being a perforation versus being. Uh, um, being a you know just a normal thing after laparoscopy. Let's say this mm -hmm. patient is a, has never had any operations or anything, then I would be starting to worry. It is a small amount of air, so this amount of air, although although it's there, it is a small amount. But it, if it's, the patient never had anything before, then I have to start worrying. Is this an ulcer, for example? That is is that a duodenal ulcer that is giving small amount of air? Because the small bowels usually would give would leak only small amount of air, versus the colon would be huge amount. So a small diverticuli diverticulitis that is perforated can give a huge amount of air in the in the abdomen. Oh, okay. Mm. All right. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, you Mama. Thank you. Thank you, Say. Thank you, doctor. Okay. So this is those two slides are summaries of what we what we talked about. Uh, always start with patient ID, know your patient, know what what they present with, that they present with, shortness of breath, um, hemoptysis, what they present with. And then move through image quality, go through the four steps of image quality, move on to trachea, um, focus on whether or not your patient is rotated, because if this patient is rotated, then maybe the trachea is falsely displaced. And then move on to breathing in bones, circulation, diaphragm delicates, extras, and um, here's our case. Um, I don't think we'll have enough time to go through the case, but I'll give you guys this case with a chest x-ray. You can um, 
you know, send me whatever you need. Um, if you need me to check your answers or if you guys want to discuss this now, I don't mind if you guys, if someone is willing to unmute their mics. If not, then I'll just give you that case or this case for you guys to work on and then come back um, and we can discuss this. So Dana, 32 year old female presented with shortness of breath. She was febrile, which means she has a fever with a temperature of 39.5 Celsius. Auscultation revealed unilateral reduction in air entry and crackles. Where do you think the crackles would be heard? What lobe, what, or where, where would you, where would you find this? Where would you find the crackles? The upper lobe? Mm -mm. It's, it's, it's actually the lower, uh, lower base of the right lobe because it's, it has more opacity and um, usually you'd, you'd hear that at the bottom. The upper lobe is, is, is very, yeah, right lung, absolutely, Sara. The, 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 the lungs here look fine. They look uh, black, nice. You can see there's air entry, um, uh, et cetera. Um, one last point. Um, so many people have this, this idea about um, um, x-rays. So when you take an x, when you want your patient to take an x-ray, you have to ask him to inhale, then hold, take the x-ray. And that's how we have air, because if you're exhaling, this will probably look white. So um, this patient inhaled for this patient to have um, this image. So go through the steps, um, try to figure them out. Um, if you, if, if someone wants to unmute and, um, and answer this case, um, I'll give you guys two minutes. Otherwise, we'll end the we'll end the presentation here. So it's up to you guys. Okay. So um, here are my, my references. And if you guys want to discuss um, any of these topics, please um, uh, message me on Instagram. I will be uploading this um, video or this presentation on YouTube um, as soon as I can. If you guys have any questions, please unmute and ask me, ask me whatever questions you need to know about. Thank you, Maha. Thank you, Sayed. Thank you, Maha, that was really nice. Thank it's you, wonderful. Victoria. It's a great effort. I, I love what you've done. It's really nice. It was a great revision for us as well. Yeah, thank because you. we're currently in our you rotation. So great thank cases. You. You, you were focusing on the important stuff, and it's great job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bless you. All right. Thank you, Ma. So, uh, everyone, I'll just post uh, yeah. the survey. It will uh, probably take you less than uh, 30 seconds. Just uh, five or six uh, multiple choice questions. So thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoy your day and hope to catch you in the next session. Awesome. Thank you.